Okay, so I'd say welcome back, not really welcome back, uh, but I hope you uh, got at least some time to uh, grab drinks uh, in our five minute break. And I already see that our next speaker is with us. Um, it's Dr. Bernd Geiger from Semaphora. He'll be talking about free text to knowledge graphs, the holy grail of semantic computing on an industrial scale. Your academic background is in physics and you worked at the German Cancer Research Center at Leica at Carl Zeiss and you launched several VC firms to invest in research spin-offs. So the next 50 to 20 minutes are yours, and we're excited to see what you'll be talking about. Thank you very much for being here. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here and uh, speaking to you. Um, just see, yeah, the, the slide is on. Now, um, I'm talking about the holy grail of semantic computing. So, why do you think it's the holy grail? Any uh, spontaneous idea? Uh, might be perhaps not so obvious for you. Okay, good. Then, well, the point is, uh, and I will actually cover that in the next couple of slides. Um, and it's uh, for the for the te for the nerdies, uh, nerds ab among us, as well as for business decision makers. Um, but um, so it has lots of techno technology aspects uh, in it. But um, the holy grail is because semantic computing means in the past a lot of um, you know. Uh, knowledge modeling. You actually you had to sit there and you know some you were interviewing some people like the specialists want to get their particular knowledge and do elicitation and you know then you sit there and try to put it into a model. That's of course um, one of the reasons why semantic computing hasn't been all over the place and all people talk about you know continuous uh, you know, uh, knowledge keeping and uh, but this is so far not working because it's very hard actually to get uh, a knowledge into, um, into a computer. Um, of course you can have PDFs uh, but that's not knowledge, that's uh, text. So um, next slide. Um, well, let's see why this is not working. I'll take this one here. So shortly about Semaphora. Um, Ah, come on, no. Um, Semaphore, we have been founded in 2012, you see all that. Well, we have been around for, for many years actually because this, the, the, the technology and the, 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 the predecessor company is a spin-off of the uh, Cultural Institute of Technology. Um, so um, this, the core assets has been developed with industrial partners for a very long time uh, and we are now like, uh, version 6.3 or 6.4. Um, so it's really extremely stable um, and it's, um, it's highly reliable and uh, very scalable. So it actually it fits all today's uh, needs. Um, and we have a lot of customers in, in lots of uh, different areas, so like healthcare, um, automation, um, so IoT, so, and, and of course, um, you know, knowledge processing, really at the core of text. Um, so now I quickly want to uh, tell you a little bit about um, active ontologies. So who's actually um, uh, knowledgeable of ontologies here in the audience? I mean, have you been working with ontologies? Uh, very few hands, okay. Um, so, uh, you might not have heard about active ontologies because this is a little bit, uh, that's the kind of next generation actually. Active ontologies are those ontologies who have a intrinsic functionality built in. So you actually, you have, you can have uh, static facts, that's what you all know, you have predicates, you know, classes, subclasses and all that. Um, all type of all type of data type types actually, and but you what you also can have is and that's a dynamic aspect of it. You can have uh, dynamic facts. So dynamic facts are either virtual because they are just exist for the moment when you have a certain data constellation. So this is the uh, the dynamic part in the lower part of the slide, and um, but you also can actually have self-modifying ontologies. And that's of course very important if we were talking about evolving knowledge and that could also, and this is a particular example here for the dynamic effects where you actually fetch data from IoT network um, and um, you actually um, store data if they are you know, beyond or above the gliding average. 
So this is something it's actually stored fixed uh, sta or, uh, well, uh, static in the ontology. And that's really something that therefore we call it active, onto active ontologies uh, because well, you can have actually functionality, a logic functions built in, and you can derive, and uh, that's the, uh, the, my point on the next slide. Um, so it's, uh, you can transform ontologies. Sometimes you call it, in therefore said, magically inferencing. It sounds a little bit uh, esoteric, but it's, well, you, in knowledge processing, you infer uh, knowledge, basically. And that's the whole point. So therefore, people say, talk about reasoning engines and inferencing engines. Well, it's all, it's transformations, basically, in IT terms. Um, so, and, um, uh, we are using uh, frame logic two. Um, frame logic two is or F logic uh, two is something like uh, prolog plus a hundred years or plus several de generations. So it has all this kind of what you perhaps know from. Uh, that would be interesting actually. Who has been programming in prolog? <laughs> okay, very few people. Okay, so um, just you know for Euro perhaps enlightenment, try to find out the difference between imperative programming and declarative programming. Um, it might you know, change a little bit your philosophy or your perspective on how to, res how to solve problems. And particularly when it comes to uh, uh, knowledge programming that uh, uh, can make a big difference. So next slide is, now this is a little bit of a uh, uh, small example it's from our tutorial, um, how to generate new knowledge. It's a pretty simple ex example. It's about, uh, you know, you define certain uh, vehicles and uh, you have people and you know and you have uh, admissible uh, driver and pe people who own a car and um, and uh, actually you derive basically um, uh, who is a, who might be a friend of someone else by uh, drawing that out of the that this person is also admissible driver so this is a very simple example but, but basically it shows you how you derive new facts from existing facts by applying certain functions. And that's the whole point of it. Now, um, one particular area which I think is a p particularly important because uh, it comes back to my initial statement why this is the holy grail. So, so far, as I said, um, people were trying to build ontologies based on uh, knowledge, on, on to, to, based on domain knowledge, actually kept in the heads of experts. And they tried to model all that, you know, kind of typing it in, typing the relations, you know, they build all the facts and what belongs together and perhaps taxonomies and all that. Well, you could read in the taxonomy anyway. But um, if you could do that all automatically, that is uh, certainly a huge step. Um, in the processing of knowledge. And um, well, humans can read and understand text, uh, of course. A computer can read it, but not understand. Uh, so in particular, when we talk about knowledge, it's always, you have heard perhaps about the term triple. It's about, you know, well, some people say SPO, subject, predicate, object. It's uh, typically, it's a, only the relationship between two objects. So. Um, someone is actually handing you something over. So there's already um, uh, kind of four relationships. So it's, uh, it's already specified uh, that what is handed over. But um, that is basically the knowledge of this, this sentence or this small sentence. And if you, know, you can store that like in a traditional database uh, that this is a relationship, uh, so you have already gained a huge advantage because out of a natural and natural text, I'm, you know, to, you, I'm thinking about English language, or, and you pulled it out, that's uh, not easy to do. And it's, uh, you cannot do that with uh, statistical AI, and I come to that point in, in a second. Um, uh, but, but you need a, a very different approach, a kind of combined approach, a hybrid approach. But again, I come to, the, to this in a second. Why, where is this important particularly? Uh, I guess the, uh, you know, the biggest area are regulating documents and those people who actually depending on those um, uh, regulating documents. Well, this could be, for example, certification industry. Uh, we have huge business in the certification industry uh, where people rely on 
um, well, technical standards to approve certain facilities or certain machinery, new machinery, which wants to be or needs to be introduced to the market, but needs to have certification that is allowed to be sold in the market. So now, this machinery comes with specifications, and they need to be matched against um, standards, technical standards. And this matching uh, typically is done by analysts. Um, I've been told uh, those analysts they fetch like 65 percent uh, uh, in worst case or kind of middle case uh, of what's, what's the difference between those two uh, papers, uh, so standard and specification. Um, and, but with, with, if you can do that automatically, of course, that's a, first of all a huge quality gain, and secondly, it's a huge saving in, in cost because you know, expert costs, they could be more spent or the expert could spend their time on you know, more creative things, but less than on doing pure analytics, if you can do that analytics in, um, in a computer. Now, so it's about uh, empowering computers, performing an, an, uh, natural language understanding. Um, now, what, we, what I want to show you in particular use case is in the investment business, compare or doing gap analysis of two contracts, two contract versions. Um, of course, you can do that with pure, um, you know, text comparison, like you know, word function, the difference functions, the delta versions. Uh, but then you get a semiotic difference, meaning only the uh, basically the signs or the the, 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 the the words or the characters are compared. What is new? And what is or what is uh, has been uh, striked out? You do not get actually implications. So that's coming back to this term inferencing. Uh, so implications of this uh, deletion of a, of a word or addition of a word might have huge impact. And you want to actually understand the semantic gap of the two, of the two documents. So and um, now this is from the investment business, a company we are uh, providing uh, technology. It's a fund uh, uh, They're doing uh, digital financing. Digital financing is a, um, a contemporary term Term for what has been called in the last decade, perhaps crowd investing. Now it's called digital financing, and uh, it's a very good mean for for startups actually to um, to raise money actually for lots of from lots of people. And many startups actually had done this uh, investment phase with crowd financing in the beginning. So now I'm seeing I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, now, uh, the, the, there you have actually two contracts and, the, um, and those guys who wants to make a financing round actually um, negotiated in the uh, paragraph 21.2 uh, uh, that in the grace period, so after a kind of investment period, there's always a kind of grace period where you know, when new investors come, they could just wait until you know, the, 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 uh, the agent doesn't get any fees any longer and then do the investment. So you always define a grace period. So, um, but uh, they could actually negotiate in the contract that also venture capital money is actually um, out of uh, being part of the grace period. So whenever venture capitalist comes and invests money after the investment period, so then in this, uh, so, uh, the agent or the broker doesn't get any money any longer for fee for actually uh, facilitating the investment. So um, now, of course, this is an obvious thing. You can directly compare it. And of course, those who negotiated, uh, they know what came in. So it's new now uh, also investments by venture capital. But uh, that has impact on paragraph 19.1 because there, there is uh, all the, the renumeration actually defined, how your whole renumeration for this placement is actually, uh, uh, actually um, added together. Now, what we do here, and I hope we have then still enough time. We do a hybrid approach actually to solve this problem, to do this analysis. First of all, uh, well, in the worst case, we only have PDF files. Um, we convert it by, via symbolic AI. Um, and by the way, who, does, who knows what symbolic AI is versus statistical? Okay, not everybody, good. So symbolic is perhaps more, it's pure, you know, it's 
basically causalic versus um, correlative. So statistical AI is correlative. Uh, th this is uh, pretty much uh, uh, causalic because they have fixed dependencies. It's based on, on knowledge, on prior knowledge of uh, actually encoded in ontology. So we have this mixture, this hybrid approach, and this is very important because um, we first uh, turn PDF into JSON with all the layout information, all the, the text, then we do actually, we do a statistical AI conversion. We actually grab the engrams out of the, of the text. So we have actually uh, a resolution of the semantics on the word level. That's really on a word-based level. And actually, you see um, here this little, uh, you know, this, uh, this graph, uh, this round graph uh, type of structure. This is actually the representation on a word level of those two paragraphs. Um, so the 19.1 and the 21.2. So, and then, of course, this doesn't help you a lot because you have to convert it in a context-based um, uh, um, use case level model. And what you get, now, this is exactly the difference on the word level of those two, um, actually, of these sentences. So you see on the, on the on to on B, um, it's on the right side, there has been the venture capital investment added on the, on the word level. Um, of course, this has been uh, transferred into a use case level, so based on contract, you know, contract philosophy, how contracts are actually uh, set up. And if you, if you do a gap analysis, and that's just a simple query, you know, like a typical, you know, also that from Prolog or from, from other systems which work on declarative base, we do, uh, we have set up a function gap um, between on A and on B, and want to get the result as a gap, so we get a structure which first of all tells us, of course, that we already know uh, sentence 18, chapter 22, uh, 20.2 has been modified. Um, um, uh, investment grace period also excludes venture capital investors, but furthermore, it tells us uh, on what uh, other sentences has been impacted, and this sentence 7 to 10 in chapter 19.1, so it's the renumeration for venture capital uh, investors. Of course, this is an, a kind of a instructive example where, which shows you kind of in an instructive way the direct uh, relationship. However, if you think about more hidden relations somewhere else in text like exit losses or, or other stuff where, which has been impacted by this change in a remote uh, paragraph which uh, governs the uh, grace period, so this might have lots of impact to many other uh, articles, and you can get this all automatically via this uh, gap analysis approach. And I guess by that, I always come to the end so far. Thank you very much. I guess I'm, one, I'm out of time, huh? Uh, you are out of time, but that was uh, on point, I would say. So we do, unfortunately, don't have time for questions on stage, but thanks for your presentation, and I'm sure you'll also stick around for follow-ups. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.